This is truly such a great honor. I'm very humbled to be here today, um, but also very excited as one of few vets in the Academy uh, to look forward to interactions across human and animal health. I work on a number of different diseases, many of them zoonoses. Those are infections that can be transmitted from animals to people. Um, and I'm going to focus my talk today on rabies, uh, which typifies many of the challenges and opportunities for One Health, and particularly in terms of control and elimination of zoonotic diseases um, and neglect of tropical diseases. So many of you are probably familiar with uh, rabies. It's a, a, an acute progressive encephalitis. The disease is called by several viruses within an expanding uh, genus of Lyssa viruses. Uh, in this country, in the UK, we have a European bat Lyssa virus, um, uh, genotype 2 uh, European bat Lyssa virus, which is endemic in Dorbenton's bat. Um, but although there's a lot of interest in these um, bat viruses, I'm going to focus my talk today um, on rabies genotype 1, the classic rabies virus, uh, which is the cause of the vast majority of public health burden globally. So rabies uh, is notorious for having one of the highest case fatalities of any disease. Um, death is invariably the outcome of a very horrifying and harrowing course of disease. Often the clinical signs in the early stages can be quite nonspecific, but it progresses to more distinctive signs, including aerophobia and hydrophobia in people. We don't see those in animals. Um, and then inevitably the progression towards paralysis coma and death. It's extremely traumatizing to the family, to community members, to healthcare staff um, who are taking care of the patient. There is no effective treatment. Palliative care is the only recommended intervention um, in most settings. But in the resource-limited settings that we're working um, primarily in um, Asia and Africa, these are often not even available. And we hear terrible stories of patients being sent home to die with rabies because there's really nothing that the health systems can do. Um, even worse, patients that are kept in isolation, sometimes tied to beds uh, because of the anxiety and the aggression that the disease can provoke. So that's all harrowing and depressing, and I'm sorry to start with that. Um, but there is some very good news about rabies, and we have excellent tools. It's a 100% vaccine-preventable disease. Uh, we have vaccines for both pre- and post-exposure vaccination and prophylaxis for people. Um, I'm going to refer to that as post-exposure prophylaxis as PEP. Um, and also good vaccines for vaccination of animal reservoirs. But despite these tools, which actually have been with us for more than 100 years since the days of Louis Pasteur, who discovered the vaccines, um, rabies is still a, a serious public health problem in many parts of the world. The epidemiology of rabies can appear quite complex. The virus can infect all mammals, um, and the virus can be maintained in several different animal reservoirs. But it does simplify down to some key elements, and a key point is that more than 99% of human rabies deaths are caused by transmission of dog rabies. Um, we've been struggling in the early days of rabies because of a lack of um, reporting and understanding of the scale of the disease problem, which is true for many neglected diseases. And we developed a modeling approach based on animal bite injury data that uh, allowed us to estimate that about 59,000 people worldwide die of rabies every year. So although there are obviously uncertainties around these sorts of estimates, we're very confident about saying that tens of thousands of people are dying every year. When we look at the distribution of those cases, most of the deaths are in Asia, about 20,000 deaths every year in India, um, but the incidence of disease is highest in Africa. And Latin America gives us great hope in terms of elimination because they're really now on the brink of eliminating human deaths. But deaths are not the only burden. Um, there's a huge um, problem associated with rabies because of the high rate of exposures through bites from suspected rabid animals. We think nearly 30 million people every year are bitten by suspect rabies dogs, and each one of those events represents an emergency and requires life-saving uh, vaccination to prevent um, the onset of clinical disease. And this in itself, the, the vaccine is, uh, and the post-exposure prophylaxis is extremely effective, but the vaccine is very costly. Um, and this contributes a large part to the global uh, economic burden, which is, exceeds $8 billion a year. 
And it's very difficult for people in remote and uh, marginalized communities um, to often access this, that vaccines are not always available, and it can be very expensive and, and, and too costly for them to bear. So it's not really surprising that when we look uh, in this graph here at the probability of a a uh, bite victim receiving post-exposure prophylaxis. It's higher in the richer countries, shown by the high development index, and uh, lower in the poorer countries. But it's not just the poorer countries, it's the poorest communities within those countries. So we've been very concerned about these inequalities and in access to life-saving vaccines. Um, and a lot of the uh, thrust of what we've been doing is to really bring together both arms of the preventive approach, improving access to human vaccine, and scaling up of mass dog vaccination to target the animal reservoir to try and uh, get at this problem. And a recent modeling exercise that was carried out by WHO Modeling Consortium uh, demonstrates this in the figure here. So under the status quo shown here in the red line, we anticipate more than a million deaths, um, human deaths from rabies um, uh, from now until 2035. If we improve access to PP, and as a result of this study, Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance has now included human vaccine um, into their investment strategy. Improving this access uh, definitely can save a large number of lives, but the best outcome we get is if we bring together human, uh, improved human vaccination and scaling up of mass dog vaccination, shown in the blue slide. Um, because the dog vaccination will allow us to reach and protect people who are going to struggle to access PP. It doesn't rely on them being able to get to a medical facility. And it will be the only way that we have of eliminating canine rabies. So a lot of my work has been looking at the feasibility of mass dog vaccination and challenging a lot of dogmas that have really hindered our progress um, up to now. So time and time again throughout my work, I've been hearing problems like it's impossible to do anything about dog rabies because rabies and wildlife makes it futile. There's simply too many stray dogs in Africa and Asia. It'd be impossible to vaccinate enough dogs. It'd be way too expensive to vaccinate them all. And one by one, we've been chipping away at these barriers, which have really been a, a, a reason for inertia in the field. Um, and uh, one by one, those barriers are coming down. I started first really looking at the wildlife question, rabies reservoirs, um, and we were working in the Serengeti, which obviously is an ideal place to look at this with dogs living in very close proximity to abundant and diverse um, uh, wildlife communities. And ra identifying rabies turns out to be a very tough challenge. Um, uh, we only have to look at the situation of bovine TB in this country to appreciate that. So we draw on a lot of different types of approaches different types of analyses to bring together different um, lines of evidence. Um, observational epidemiological studies, mathematical modeling, phylogenetic analyses, and intervention studies. And all of these consistently point to a single interpretation, which is that uh, rabies uh, in the Serengeti ecosystem is maintained only by domestic dogs uh, and not by an independent wildlife reservoir. And this is illustrated in this scheme here, with rabies circulating, persisting in domestic dogs, uh, with some uh, transmission to wildlife. There are short chains of transmission among wildlife hosts, but these are not sustained. So if we disrupt transmission through mass dog vaccination and break this cycle of transmission, we prevent transmission to wildlife. In the absence of dog rabies, these cycles then disappear and we're able to eliminate the infection. So is mass dog vaccination feasible and cost-effective? Well, the intervention studies we've done using dog vaccination have allowed us to address a number of operational uh, questions. And the first one was that the vast majority of dogs are accessible for vaccination despite appearances. They're not stray dogs. Most, uh, pretty much all dogs in Africa are owned and they're given names. And this is just a snapshot of one of our vaccine registers uh, to demonstrate that the names they do exist for all the dogs, and also that they actually uh, have an interesting selection of names reflecting um, uh, major political figures and global events. So we see uh, Saddam featuring quite heavily in the early days of the first Gulf War and the second Gulf War, um, Osama peaking in the early 2000s, and Bush fairly consistent in the 2000s. But there is a serious point here. These dogs have names, and they can be handled, and they can be vaccinated. And dogs of all ages can be vaccinated. As vets, we tend to um, uh, vaccinate dogs once they've got to three months of age and older, but uh, we've shown that 
younger pups can be safely vaccinated. That's a really important age group to, to cover in these campaigns. Um, and we've also demonstrated the thermotolerance of vaccines, which is a really important characteristic. Uh, thermotolerance of vaccines was critical in the success of the Rinderpest vaccination campaign, Rinderpest being only the second infection to be eradicated. And this opens up for us some exciting new avenues for vaccine delivery. So all of this leads us to be confident and believe that elimination of canine rabies is a feasible objective. Um, if we can reach 70% coverage during campaigns, uh, we've shown that this is sufficient to control outbreaks, as, as shown by these figures here from Tanzania. And interestingly, this target is consistent across a very wide range of settings um, in Asia and Africa. The values of R0, the basic reproduction number for rabies, uh, consistently fall between one and two. Um, and we don't understand that very well, but it gives us confidence that with 70% coverage, we can really uh, reach and eliminate rabies in all dog populations. So dog pop, uh, vaccination, we've shown, prevents human deaths. It reduces demand for costly PEP at the 70% coverage. Uh, this is also the most, uh, the optimal scenario in terms of cost effectiveness um, for dog vaccination. And all of this evidence has collectively uh, been influential in leading WHO, OIE, which is the World Animal Health Organization, FAO, and the Global Alliance for Rabies Control, to set a target of zero human deaths from dog-mediated rabies by 2030. So this is something we're working on very actively at the moment in terms of scaling up to reach that target. It's getting close. But I'm also interested in the broader benefits that rabies vaccination can have. Um, both in terms of health system strengthening and integrated delivery. We're increasingly aware of the problems of community uh, mistrust of health authorities and health professionals. The situation in DRC at the moment in relation to Ebola brings us into stark focus. But I don't think it's really surprising uh, that mistrust is growing. If we as a sort of uh, international bodies really only respond to health crises when they concern us. And I think rabies and diseases like it give us a really important opportunity to get into communities um, and work with people, building trust on a, a daily basis. Rabies is a very visible disease. The uh, impacts of uh, dog rabies vaccination um, uh, accrue very quickly. Um, they're very tangible to people. Um, and, and this is just one of the ways that we can really build up that trust um, and uh, ensure the confidence of community members in health systems and also build that intersectoral uh, collaboration between human and animal health that's needed. And on a very practical level, it's also, I think, provides a very useful platform for other interventions. I'm becoming involved in a guinea worm eradication program. There's concerns about guinea worm appearing in dogs. And the best way and the most cost-effective way to do surveillance in dogs is likely through dog rabies vaccination. And this, uh, the figure at the bottom here just shows an integrated dog vaccination um, program that was linked with treatment of people against all transmitted helmets. So there are very many wins from targeting a disease like rabies. And I hope that I'll be able to come back in 10 years' time and to report that we really are on the brink or have eliminated uh, deaths from this terrible disease and to fulfill Pasteur's vision more than 100 years ago to rid the world of this terrible disease. Just quickly say, I forgot to mention one of my slides, two really key collaborators on an earlier slide, Katie Hampson and Tiziana Lembo, who work with me very closely in now leading a lot of that work. And Tiziana actually was a recipient of a springboard grant, um, and she's now become an independent researcher. So I, I just do need to thank my collaborators on this work, as well as funders um, uh, through the years, and, and to thank you all. Thank you.